We are reading Touching Spirit Bear, and this is chapter 18. By the time Cole and Edwin returned to camp, Garvey was up and had a fire burning. He sat on a stump of driftwood, sipping coffee and looking out over the bay. As they approached, he turned and pointed. Look at the whales out there breaching. Edwin nodded. Those are the humpbacks after herring. They're following their instincts. Every spring, they migrate up from calving grounds in Hawaii. I've never seen whales before, Cole said, except on TV. We'll dance the whale dance tonight, Edwin said. Is anybody hungry, Cole said, lowering a cooler from the tree. He dug through the food for a jar for a box of cold cereal, retrieved a jug of water, then mixed some powdered milk and began to eat. Edwin eyed Cole, wolfing down the cereal. You might want to work on, you might want something more than cold cereal to work on. That's all I usually eat for breakfast. If you guys want something different, fix it yourself. Edwin and Garvey both helped themselves to bowls of cereal. Suit yourself. You're the one working, champ, Garvey said. Aren't you helping at all? We'll show you what to do, said Edwin, but every ounce of work is going to be yours. But I can't nail with my bad arm. Then learn to use the other arm, Edwin said. If you build the cabin well, you'll stay dry and comfortable. Build it poorly, and... Edwin shrugged. It'll be a long winter. I built the last shelter for you, and I built it well. I still feel hurt from what you did. If you burn this cabin, you only hurt yourself. Edwin handed Cole a pair of leather gloves. Here, these will keep you from getting blisters. I might have a bum arm, but I'm not a wimp, Cole said, setting the gloves aside. Your choice, said Edwin, as he began showing Cole how to lay out the frame for the cabin. By mid-morning, Cole had connected four squared beams and set them on large rocks that served as the foundation. He nailed planks to the square frame. These he covered with plywood flooring, making a large rectangular platform roughly the size of his room at home. Each nail he drove took about 10 swings using his left hand, but gradually his swings got better. As he worked, his stomach growled for food, but he wouldn't admit he was hungry, not in front of Edwin and Garvey. The two sat around the fire, watching and offering suggestions. Everything had to be just right. The sun was almost overhead when Cole finally had to stop for lunch. He was starved and felt half dead as he built up the fire and dug out spaghetti noodles and a can of sauce. He put them into a pan, which he balanced on a rock in the fire. How come everything has to be so tight and exact on the cabin, he asked. I'm not living here my whole life. About 10,000 mice are hoping you build it loose, Garvey said. Edwin motioned to the north. When the first winter storm comes with 50 mile an hour winds, you'll know why. After their meal, Garvey showed Cole how to lay out wall panels on the ground. By now, big blisters had formed on Cole's hands, and with a sheepish grin at Edwin, he pulled on the leather gloves. Go ahead, say I told you so, he said. Pride has no place on this island, Edwin answered. By late that evening, when Garvey suggested he stop work for the day, Cole's hunger again nodded his belly. How about some more cold cereal, Garvey said. Real funny, Cole said, pulling out hamburger from the cooler. Some of us have been working. The smile on Garvey's face irritated Cole as he pulled the gloves off his sore and blistered hands. He examined his work. All four wall panels lay ready to be lifted into place. There was space for a door and one small window facing out toward the bay. It still bugged Cole that Edwin and Garvey wouldn't help with anything. He made up three hamburgers but deliberately put only one in the pan to cook. Edwin and Garvey watched him as he ate his burger. When Cole finished, he yawned. I'm beat, he said. There's the hamburger if you guys want some. I'm going to bed. You'll cook for everyone, Edwin said, and then we will all dance. Do you need your shoelaces tied too? Cole mumbled as he returned to the fire and began cooking again. Make us a feast, Garvey said, not just food. Grudgingly, Cole cooked the last two hamburgers, covering them with mushrooms, onions, and cheese. He walked out away from camp while Edwin and Garvey ate. After supper, Cole washed the dishes at the water's edge, gingerly rubbing gravel on the plates to clean them. The raw blisters on his hands stung like fire. It was dark when he returned to the fire and flopped down wearily on a stump. Edwin had stoked the flames into a bright blaze. 
Now we dance, he said. He stood and walked close to the fire. All around us there are powers. There are animals like the whale, the bear, the wolf, and the eagle. There are powers like the sun and moon and seasons. And there are powers inside of us like happiness and anger. We can feel all of these and dance to them. They all have much to teach us. Today we saw the whale, so tonight we'll dance the whale dance. Each of us will tell what we learned from watching the whale. Edwin curled his arms over his head, imitating a whale's head, and began to pace around the fire, dipping his head up and down as if breaking through the waves. He exaggerated his motions, ducking and diving, lost in his make-believe world. After ten minutes of moving around the fire, he slowed to a stop, then sat down. Next, Garvey stood. In his own way, he began moving around the fire, jumping up and to the side to imitate a whale breaching. He made exaggerated expressions with his face. Around and around the fire he moved, finally slowing until he sat down and rested peacefully on a log near the flames. He looked up at Cole. Your turn. I don't know how to dance, Cole said. It's not something you learn, Edwin said. Feel it. Become a whale and learn what it has to teach you. Self-conscious, but also aware of the warning in Edwin's tone, Cole stood and began circling the fire. He bent at the waist and moved with jerky motions, trying to pretend he was gliding through water the way whales in the bay had. He kept looking over at Edwin and Garvey, imagining how stupid he must look circling the flames. He was glad nobody from school could see him. Gradually, he moved faster, trying to imagine a whale migrating thousands of miles, being led by instinct. Lowering and rising, Cole wandered off away from the fire, then pretended the fire was the goal of his long migration. On his way to the fire, he leapt back and forth, chasing schools of fish. Nearing the flames, he closed his eyes and leaped high into the air to breach. He landed on his hands and feet. For a few moments, he stared into the flames, then sat down. He held his blistered hands tightly to his stomach. After a time of silence, Edwin said, the whale is graceful and gentle. Tonight, I learned those things. Garvey nodded and said, The whale is also smart and powerful. That is what I learned from my dance. After, after several long minutes, Garvey said, Cole, what did you learn from your dance? Cole had been thinking, A whale migrates, but it doesn't have a home. He picked up a small stick and traced it in the dirt. I feel like a whale, he said softly. When nobody spoke for several minutes, Garvey stood. This has been a good day, he said. Now it's time to hit the sack. He turned and handed Cole a tube of ointment. Use this on your blisters before going to sleep, and make sure you put a tarp over the firewood or it will get waterlogged by morning. Thanks, Cole said. He turned to Edwin. What would a dance of anger be like? That's the hardest dance of all, because you face your anger and you release it. Will we do that dance some night? Cole asked. You'll do that dance alone after Garvey and I leave. You'll do that dance only when you're ready. Unlike the night before, Cole had no trouble falling asleep. He slept hard, waking only to shift positions on the rocky ground. With first light, Edwin, ag Edwin again woke him by shaking his shoulder. It's time to go to the water again, he whispered. Cole rolled away from Edwin's hand. Can't we skip just one day, he groaned. Edwin shook his shoulder again. Not until your anger skips a day. Why doesn't Garvey join us, Cole argued. Maybe he's not angry. Does that mean you're angry if you're going? It means I'm going to get angry if you don't get your butt up. Grumbling, Cole crawled stiffly from his warm sleeping bag. This morning, his hip and arm hurt so bad he almost cried out. It felt as if cement had hardened in his joints. Cole looked out into the gathering light and the steady drizzle. The last time he saw this kind of steady drizzle, he had been fighting for his life. Now he was going swimming in a freezing pond. He couldn't believe this was real. As Cole stepped from the tent, Edwin handed him a rain jacket. Without speaking, the two left camp and hiked to the stream in the shadowy dawn. From there, they once again entered the water and waded up the edge of the stream until they reached the pond. Edwin crawled under a large spruce tree and stripped off his clothes. Place your clothes near the trunk to keep them dry, he said. 
they would stay drier if I left them on and stayed out of the water, said Cole as he began undressing. Soon he and Edwin sat together on the rocky ledge. Edwin made no effort to speak. How long do we sit here? Cole asked impatiently. Until your mind is clear and you have a choice between anger and happiness. I'm not mad today, said Cole. My head's clear and I feel like I have a choice right now. Then sit here until you're numb, Edwin said, his voice edgy. Each time it gets easier. Someday you'll want to get up and come here. That'll be the day, Cole grumped, shivering. He felt his skin growing numb and his breath cooling. Finally, Edwin stood as if some invisible timer had gone off in his head. Without rushing, he returned to shore. Cole followed gladly. I can't wait to get back and start a big bonfire, he said as they toweled off. This morning, you'll take time to meet your ancestors first, Edwin said in his matter-of-fact voice. Do what? Edwin didn't answer. He finished dressing, then walked toward the rocky slope beside the pond. As he angled along the bottom, he searched the ground. Suddenly, he stopped over and picked up a rock the size of a bowling ball. He ran his fingers fondly across the rough surface as if he had touched the rock before. What are you doing? Cole asked. Touching my ancestors. You're too weird, Cole said. Edwin handed the rock to Cole. What do I do with this? asked Cole. Just follow me. I'll explain. Edwin started up the rocky slope. Trust me. How far are we going? Cole asked. Edwin continued up the long slope. Grumbling, Cole followed. As they walked, Edwin spoke. Your life isn't an accident. Many generations of your ancestors struggled through life, learning lessons, making mistakes, just as you have. Each generation passed on to the next what they learned and all they become. After several hundred feet, Cole's right arm ached from carrying the heavy stone. He stopped and looked back. They were barely halfway up the slope. Pretend that rock is your ancestors, said Edwin. Climbing this hill is your life. With each step, you carry your ancestors with you, in your mind, in your heart, and in your soul. If you listen, your ancestors reach out from the rock and teach you the lessons of their struggles. Hear your ancestors. Someday, you'll pass those lessons on to others. Cole acknowledged Edwin's words with a weary grunt and struggled on without complaining. By the time they reached the top, he breathed heavily. He was about to drop the rock to the ground when Edwin reached out, took the heavy stone, and set it down carefully. Treat your ancestors gently, he said. Cole shrugged. What are they, wimps? Edwin ignored Cole's comment. I've carried that stone up this hill hundreds of times, he said. This very same rock? Edwin nodded. You mean you carry it back down again, too? Edwin smiled. There's a better way. Once the rock is set down, it changes meaning. Now it becomes your anger. Go ahead, roll the rock down the hill. Roll away your anger. Cole crouched and gave the rock a shove. He watched as it crashed back down the slope. That should make the ancestors dizzy, he laughed. Imagine your anger rolling away, Edwin said patiently. Cole was still chuckling about his dizzy ancestors. He couldn't believe he had carried a rock all the way up here just to shove it back down again. Each time you do this, you'll find more meaning, Edwin said, and you'll learn respect. What do you mean each time I do this? I'm not going to carry that stupid rock up this hill every day. Stay angry if you want. It's up to you. When I was here at your age, I found it was good to carry the rock every morning after my swim. Cole turned to Edwin. What makes you think you know everything that's good for me? Edwin drew in a long, deep breath. I don't. Nobody does. We all search for answers, the same as you. Then why do you keep telling me what to do? Edwin smiled. That's the first intelligent question I've heard you ask all morning. He shrugged. Maybe Garvey and I want redemption for our own mistakes in life. We were never able to help those we hurt. Well, it's my life, Cole said, not yours. We should have stayed in the water longer, Edwin said, heading back down toward the hill, toward camp.